Okay, so looks like we're on a good point to start. Uh, all right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ilya Chakrigin. I'm founding engineer at Abound. Um, I'm also lead maintainer on a cross plane project. It's an open source project we started at Abound about eight months ago. And we open sourced it right before KubeCon in Seattle last uh, December. And today I want to talk to you about extending Kubernetes to orchestrate and support uh, resources managed by public cloud providers. All right, so over the last decade, we have witnessed the uh, emergence of cloud computing as predominant IT paradigm. Cloud computing enables uh, organization to focus on the core business competencies and uh, quickly respond to changing demands without expending significant resources on infrastructure and maintenance. Organizations can take, uh, instantly take advantage of the world-class services uh, across infrastructure, and they can do so with uh, scale the businesses globally with efficient pay-per-use model. Uh, yet despite its predominance, the cloud computing remains uh, completely under the control of small set of cloud providers. Amazon, Microsoft, uh, and Google are at the front of the race and compete aggressively for market share and talent. And while these providers themselves are heavy adopters of open source technologies, the cloud computing remains predominantly proprietary and closed source. Uh, each cloud provider offers a walled garden of uh, proprietary services that are designed to lock in and keep the customers and maximize utilization of this specific cloud provider infrastructure. And while your own services, when you write your services, they typically run in VMs, containers, uh, service functions, or otherwise portable, more frequently they depend on uh, platform resources like databases, message queues, uh, big data, AI, machine learning, and so forth. The very resources that cloud providers offer as a managed services. And what makes managed services so appealing is that you don't have to worry about a lot of these tasks like provisioning, deploying, scaling, doing disaster recovery, backing up. In other words, all the tasks that are required to run production-grade services. The cloud providers, uh, they will take all responsibility for all those tasks. And they even give you SLA to guarantee uptime and delivery of your own services. In return, you will pay typically above and beyond to what normal hosting, hosting charges are. And uh, effectively, you could run the same services yourself on the same cloud provider and save some money, but that mar additional markup is proprietary specifically for the managed services, or for managing those services. <coughs> typically, uh, when cloud providers adopt open source technologies, they will offer the same services. For example, right here you will see MySQL offered virtual problem by every cloud provider in sub shape and form. However, the service name and wire protocol could be the only common thing. The way you provision, scale, and maintain that service could be specific for a given cloud provider. And when you look at an overlapping set of services provided by different cloud providers, uh, you can understand why there is ever-growing demand for being multi-cloud. And what is missing, a control plane that spans across multiple cloud vendors, and what is needed is the way to manage workloads and resources in uniform and consistent way across multiple clouds. So uh, we're at KubeCon, so I'm gonna still do a quick intro to Kubernetes in case not everybody very familiar with Kubernetes, just a brief couple of slides. Probably not necessary, but anyway. So Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration system for automating application deployment, scaling, and management. It was originally started on Google in June 2014. And uh, actually this month we celebrate fifth anniversary of Kubernetes. Uh, quickly, within a month, other big company like uh, Microsoft, Red Hat, IBM, Docker, they joined Kubernetes community and community became, grow, grew at exponential rate. Uh, they had first major GA release in July 2015, together with CNCF partnership announcement. And in the short five years, uh, Kubernetes became de facto the platform to run containerized workloads and services. Uh, it also achieved an amazing uh, adoption rate among cloud providers. It became virtually ubiquitous today. Every major cloud provider offers Kubernetes as a service. 
uh, with the last, uh, latest one was adopted from AWS Web Services. Uh, they offered uh, IKEAS in 2018. So um, clusters themselves became just yet another resource like a MySQL database offered by all major cloud providers. And again, similar paradigm. While provisioning them easy, but those provisioning steps could be very specific for given cloud provider. The way provision GKE could be different, slightly different, or a lot different from the way provision EKS or AKS. So uh, needless to say that Kubernetes is a pretty incredible product. It uh, revolutionized the orchestration of containerized workloads and services. And when I started using Kubernetes in 2015, I was sold on the idea. Uh, by that, at that time, all I kind of knew and cared about was running containers, services inside the containers. It took me some time to realize that perhaps the best feature of Kubernetes is Kubernetes API. Uh, <clears throat> with its declarative style, so when user express what they want, in other words, desired state of your system versus imperative style API saying that this is the steps I want to use to achieve that state. It is level based, which enables a robust behavior even if you miss in some intermediate state changes. It is complete and authoritative and most importantly, it's extensible. And last part is very important because this, in fact, that uh, what I've been doing for the last couple of years, I was working on the extensibility of Kubernetes and uh, I was writing Kubernetes in native applications. So how do you extend Kubernetes? So any programs that reads and write from Kubernetes API uh, can provide useful automation. And there is a specific pattern for writing those programs, that pattern called a control pattern. Controllers typically read objects from Kubernetes API, perform some operations, and then save either the state of operations or state of an object back to Kubernetes API. Custom resources uh, are extension of Kubernetes API. And uh, Kubernetes application combined with custom resource definition or CRD together, uh, basically it's Kubernetes application is CRD combined with the controller. And operator term was, if uh, not invented, was introduced by uh, CoreOS company, and it was a method of packaging and deploying and managing Kubernetes applications. The operator format gives uh, software developer the template which will tell Kubernetes how to deploy and manage the application. And there are several frameworks to choose to author your operator. Most popular of them, um, Operator SDK and Kube Builder are based on the controller runtime. There are many few others, some of them very similar, some of them different, like MetaController, uh, I believe it's Bash controller, and of course you can use Client Go yourself, very low level uh, library to author your own operator. In other words, right in from scratch. So if you look in basic structure of controller uh, pattern, it's kind of continuous operation, continuous loop, which basically uh, retrieve the object from Kubernetes API, compare the spec of an object to actual system state. If they're the same, maybe there's nothing needs to be done and continue. Otherwise, if there are any differences, perform some steps to bring the uh, actual state to a desired state and the save results into the object status. So when you write an operator, typically you extend Kubernetes types. So for example, the most common pattern will be my operator will create additional deployments or stateful sets and has custom logic to do something additionally which you normally would not do with the Helm installation. In other words, you do something active lifecycle management. So operator will read from API and create those Kubernetes types typically in the same cluster. And it's all kind of deployed in one cluster. And where that uh, pattern became very uh, useful is in the doing stateful set applications. Specifically those uh, applications which require some kind of data management. In other words, what started with, I believe, with CoreOS was etcd operator, Prometheus operator, and then Rook operator. In other words, all of them dealing with some additional data state, which normally you need to either some user knowledge to do manual steps. They kind of basically encoded them in operator logic. And uh, that pattern started uh, growing pretty rapidly. Uh, more and more independent vendors now package the applications with this operator format. And moreover, as you can see, that there could be multiple vendors or multiple projects dedicated to the same operator. Today, if you look at my SQL operator, you will see like up to five, or probably even more right now, types to author or people how to author the MySQL operator. And nowadays, it's almost easier to name uh, open source technologies which offer a stateful set solution or stateful application for Kubernetes who don't have operator. Basically, 
if, and if you go to a resource like, um, uh, what is it, operatorhub.io, it's a pretty good resource where you can actually list all the operators. Gradually, you can actually select by level of area of the main area right here, and you can see them all. It's not the only place. I also recommend to go check out the awesome operators. At the end of the slide, I have a reference link, and the slide is also available on the uh, website of the scheduler, uh, Kubernetes uh, KubeCon scheduler. So check out this last slide. It has reference to all links. So uh, now, if you can provision your stateful services, in other words, run your MySQL database as an operator in Kubernetes, it's kind of tempts this question. So do I really need to use many services from cloud providers? Do I really need to use RDS from AWS or Cloud SQL? And um, this notion has very appealing as aspect. When you run your <clears throat> data and database services in the same Kubernetes cluster, you ultimately have this ultimate portability. When you run stateless service, you can run it anywhere. You can run it on your laptop. You can run it in any Kubernetes cluster anywhere, in Minikube, GKE, on-prem. And it's easy because it's stateless. Once you state get involved, now you decide what to run it. However, if you put your stateful applications also on Kubernetes, ultimately you have this portability, you can run it as well anywhere. However, this thing has the, well, ultimate portability is a goal, it has the, some problems as well. Some of them temporarily, some of them can be maybe long term. Uh, for example, uh, not all operator applications are very mature in the sense that even frameworks themselves, like uh, control runtime, may be not exactly mature today. So they're still evolving. Uh, other things that when you deploy your up stateful application, you still don't have this unified console like managed cloud providers offer you, like where you can go and see all your stateful services at scale in one glance. So kind of you can either develop your own dashboard for individual services, but in, in fact, there is not one unifying dashboard or console. You still on the hook to providing all the support and SLA for that operator. And that is the important part, because just because it's easy to deploy stateful set as an operator, it still does not absolve you to knowing what the stateful set is doing. So in other words, you still need to have the main knowledge of this given service. And sometimes it's a little bit more than if you run, let's say, in the cloud provider, because cloud providers themselves take some responsibilities for doing that, for doing all those tasks I mentioned earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, what happens is that we can actually take the same operator pattern and we can extend it not necessarily only to Kubernetes types. We can take operator pattern and extend it to types outside of Kubernetes. So for example, just like I can use operator pattern and create stateful set for MySQL using Kubernetes API, I can take the same concept and use cloud provider API and cloud provider SDK libraries to provision services on the cloud provider. So instead of doing MySQL in cluster, I can run MySQL in AWS using AWS provider API library to schedule and start up RDS instances, or Cloud SQL, or MySQL Azure. And with exactly those goals in mind, we started and introduced the cross-plane project. Uh, we open, as I mentioned earlier, we open sourced it right before the KubeCon in, September, uh, in Seattle last December. Excuse me. And the cross-plane is multi-cloud control plane. A single cross-plane enables um, provisioning and full lifecycle management of services and infrastructure across a wide range of providers and regions. Cross-plane uh, presents a declarative management style API that will cover a wide range of portable abstractions, including databases, clusters, buckets. That's what we initially started. Since then, we added Redis clusters, and we're working in adding more and more resources. And uh, cross-plane based on declarative uh, resource model of Kubernetes. And it applies many concepts uh, from container orchestration to multi-cloud workload and resource orchestration. Cross-plane uh, runs atop of Kubernetes, and I'm sorry, uh, yes, atop of Kubernetes and leverages cloud provider infrastructure. Crossplane extends Kubernetes API uh, via customer resource definition. In other words, Crossplane is an operator. And each managed resource is represented by dedicated CRD. So today, uh, we support uh, three cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and Google. And we support, as I mentioned already, resources like relational databases, Redis memory caches, clusters themselves, and buckets. 
In addition to uh, managed resources and providers, Crossplane has notion of the res uh, resource classes and resource claims. So um, let's say, first let's take a look at the cloud provider as a resource. Here's an example of defining cloud provider YAML for Crossplane. You can see it has a two parts. First part is the secret, which contains cloud provider credentials. And second part is the provider which has a reference to that secret and maybe have additional metadata, like in this case, it's AWS, it has a region information. Now, each cloud provider has a CRD, and it has also a dedicated controller, or may have a dedicated controller, which will perform additional provider validation. Similarly to provider, Crossplane represents every single managed resource by a dedicated CRD. Each CRD is strongly typed uh, using Cloud Provider API for that resource, and we try to um, uh, kind of model it after the Cloud Provider API. And each type has a dedicated controller, uh, which is responsible for provisioning, uh, validating, and uh, once a resource comes up and become available, for generating connection secrets so it can be consumed from the applications. It's also responsible for tracking the status, and if it's diverged from declarative, declared state, it will attempt to make adjustable states just like similar in Kubernetes when you create a deployment. You run, let's say, tell deployment run with three pods. If, let's say, one pod died or serious node died, Kubernetes will automatically schedule new pods. So similar to that, it will attempt to do the same active reconciliation against resources. So if something changed in the resource, it will try at automatically in extra reconcile loop to ratify and make sure the changes match into declarative, declarative state. And this is the example of MySQL server in Azure provider. Notice that it has pretty much the property set. It's not a complete property set, but effectively which matches Azure API. So in addition to cloud providers and uh, managed resources, Crossplane uh, presents clean separation concerns by introducing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, resource classes and resource claims. So developers, when I'm as an application developer, I typically don't really care what my SQL instance I'm using. Squint, and not, sometimes I do care. But anyway, if I'm writing my application, let's say WordPress, and it needs to consume my SQL, I really don't need to know it comes from the AWS RDS or from Cloud SQL or from somewhere else. What I do care is the connection string and credentials. So I can connect to it and my application can perform a business logic. Now, uh, you, as, you as a cloud or cluster administrator can use classes which modeled very closely or inspired by Kubernetes storage classes and storage claims. You can model the resource class providing all this metadata needed to provision resource. And claim can be now slimmed down and have very limited information. So for example, here's this uh, class for, uh, yes, for standard Azure MySQL. If you notice, it has very similar properties as a raw resource, which we'll look in a couple slides back. So right here, this is the actual resource, concrete resource MySQL server, and this is class for that. So they're very similar in terms of completeness of the properties. Now, if we look on the claim uh, for this resource, it now has a very limited information. In fact, it only has a class reference and potentially now has the engine version for MySQL, which I want to use. So it has a very powerful concept. Now, I'm as an application developer, can use this claim and say, hey, give me my SQL in this cloud provider with the engine version 5.7. You as a cloud administrator can define what it means to provision my SQL in AWS, for example, or in Azure with all those properties. So uh, it kind of creates two interesting notions. First of all, it has separation of concerns. I don't know all these details of infrastructure. Moreover, I don't know the credentials to provision those resources. Those could be stored away in the protected namespace, let's say, a cross plane system namespace to which I'm as application developer don't have access to. So I cannot simply go ahead and provision any resources nearly willy. However, cross plane will understand the claim and will match with the resource class and provision and fulfill this request, returning back the connection secret. <clears throat> okay. Let's look at the next slide. Yes, so now I can model my application in similar fashion. This is just mock-up example, otherwise it will not fit on the screen. <laughs> but on top, I have my claim, or my SQL claim, saying so give me my SQL of engine version 5.7. And this is a WordPress deployment, which will consume that claim. And in this case, the MySQL instance would generate the secret with the same name. 
which now I can mount in my deployment and now consume credentials, username, password, even connection string from it, using them as the properties, for example. Where are the properties? Somewhere there. Yeah, somewhere here. So now, if you look at this YAML file or manifest for application, if I were need to deploy this against, let's say, a different cloud provider, let's pretend that it was defined against Azure and I decided to deploy it against <coughs> AWS, very little need to change in this YAML file. <clears throat> I'm as application developer, in fact, may even use the same class name if they were defined in abstract names. You as a cloud administrator now need to furnish all the resource classes for the cloud provider. So now you can actually define classes for as many cloud providers as we support, and I can apply exactly the same manifest file and provision my service without any changes. So that actually creates this very powerful concept of portability of my application. Now I can run and deploy it in any cloud provider without changes to manifest itself. So, if that would be not enough, so there's more to that. <laughs> In addition to cloud providers, resources, uh, resource classes and claims, cross-plane provide definition and support for workloads. So what workload does is basically bring this all together. So now in one uh, concise document, I can define my payload in terms of deployments or services, what I have to, my resources, and string it all together. And since I mentioned earlier that cross-plane is capable of provisioning Kubernetes clusters, now I can run cross-plane and a thin Kubernetes cluster, let's say in my laptop and Minikube. And I define workload of the WordPress application and I can provide credentials to my cross-plane say for AWS, Google, and Azure. And I say, go ahead and deploy it. And what can happen if that cross-plane will say, oh, I need to find a cluster where to put this workload. Well, I don't have any. So go ahead and schedule one. And it actually can figure out which to schedule. Today, cross-plane supports direct scheduling through the indication, okay, schedule and not cluster specifically, you will have to provide cluster selector. In the future, we can have a cost-based scheduler. In other words, we can say, oh, where's it cheaper to run my WordPress today? Where's, which cloud provider gives me better price for managed database? Deploy it there. Moreover, if you run in conjunction with other applications, you can use affinity, anti-affinity, and say, what is the best proximity or latency to deploy my applications? And Crossplane will fulfill that and if there is no matching cluster, it can go ahead and provision one for you. So uh, last, uh, in, this, in, in December in Seattle, I did the demo, and you can still find it on YouTube, where basically I use this concept, I provision cross-plane using the same YAML file across three cloud providers and run the WordPress deployment across it. So I started with only cross-plane in my laptop, and I end up with the JKE, EKS, and AKS, and oh, three managed database providers, like uh, RDS, Cloud SQL, and MySQL Azure, and deploy the WordPress application to three target clusters, all from scratch, just only providing credentials for the cloud provider. So our bound mission is to create uh, a more open cloud computing platform. And at the heart of every cloud is a control plane. And we hope that cross-plane could become the control plane for open cloud. Uh, with open control plane, you can, uh, anyone can add new API and extend uh, to manage any open source or even commercial resources. Okay. So we are at the very beginning of our journey. Uh, our bond is a very young company. We started about uh, January 2018. So uh, cross plane is a very young project as well. So I encourage every one of you to come on GitHub, go on GitHub and check out and go through the examples. Um, we have a lot of walkthrough examples um, from the WordPress, from specific services, or even GitLab example where we can run complete enterprise grade deployment of GitLab in cloud providers of your choice. In fact, GitLab partnership was very important for us. We kind of working closely with them as a real world application example to vet and proof our design concepts and constructs in cross-plane. With that, um, again, check it out. Give us your feedback, submit PRs, open issues. And it was a privilege to talk to you today. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> okay, open floor for questions. I guess we have time for Q&A, so if anyone have questions, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. I can see you can uh, create uh, deployments 
uh, to a destination uh, cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you schedule your uh, deployment among these clusters, such as two clusters or three clusters? Right. So today, uh, Crosspoint supports the scheduler through cluster selector. So in your workload, you will say select cluster based on the criteria. So just like in the common label selector, you can say select where provider equals AWS, for example. So you will actually have to specify. That's the way it works today. You can, okay. Or even you can say, if you name your clusters, not exactly as cattle, you can say deploy in that green cluster. Okay. Tomorrow, in the future, you can say, okay, define the cluster where cheaper to run. So you can create schedule. We can we work on the creation of schedule, which can be cost optimized. Find the cheaper cluster to uh, provision this workload. So in other words, if I'm using Redis database, the cluster, which cloud provider gives me better rate or lowest price to run Redis? Then you can actually put your workload in that cloud provider. Okay. So um, from now, uh, so we, we can schedule our, pro uh, our deployment of uh, among two clusters. No, no, not today, exactly. So I think what you're asking maybe more closer to federation type yeah, question. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay. Yes, while cross-plane uh, work scheduling, workload scheduling is similar to federation in the sense of propagation, we shared a lot of concepts and we kind of learned lessons from federation how to propagate our resources. The model is slightly different. In federation, you will have a control plane where you deploy your resource here and it will be propagated based on your labels, annotations, yes. or templatization to Crossplane have slightly different objective. We're saying that we're not going to do uh, propagation to multiple clusters. We'll have specific cluster deployment only. Okay. Because again, right now, we're not pursuing yet the model where we're going to have one application instance distributed across multiple clusters. Because that involves also solving the networking layer yes. underneath that. In other words, when I deploy my WordPress in Google okay. Cloud and AWS, I want to make sure that they can use the same database. Something like that. So that's a little bit more challenging problem to solve. We'll work on that, and probably in the future we can have something analogous to that. Okay, yeah, let's see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, first, let's thank you for your sure. introducing to this awesome uh, project. So I think uh, my question, you had answered some, some uh, just now, but uh, I want to. Uh, uh, get more information about uh, how you manage the data, manage and sync the data between the cluster, as you know. Right. So yeah. exactly. So this is very similar to the sense, not maybe from perspective of propagation, but yes. So when we schedule the data the databases in different clusters, data right now not going to be synced. And if you want to do that, you probably need to find your technology provider, which allows you this global multi-cluster data syncing, because again, it's involving solving network problem. In the future, potentially, if we have more solutions towards how to, let's say, punch the VPN hole between two VPC clusters, we can do something like that, but we don't have it today. And uh, another question is, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think uh, you, uh, we will enhance it in the future. And uh, do you have a plan to uh, define the PV and the PVC and use it across the cost? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, uh, we're not really in the domain of uh, solving storage technology, however, uh, Abound uh, founders are the same people who started Roop project, which is very close dealing with the actual storage providers for Kubernetes clusters. So in the future, we can provision a Rook enabled cluster, which have different storage backends, cloud native backends. So that's, again, that in the works. So we don't have anything right now. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Any more? Okay. Hi, um, I have a question. When you install in, a, in the first place uh, Crossplane, you will install that in a Kubernetes cluster. That means that you've got one Kubernetes cluster that is not part of your uh, that's correct. Crossplane. Okay. Yeah, that's a, uh, you can potentially reuse the same cluster to deploy workloads as well. Kind of similar with Federation, where you share the same cluster as your cross uh, control plane cluster. But ultimately, you probably want to select cluster which has very limited permissions. Because typically when you deploy your application, it implies some level of uh, elevated credentials or permissions in that cluster. So what we typically recommend right now is to have a very lean cluster. We have a clean separation concerns, which namespaces can be used by the application developer, which namespaces can be used by administrators. However, propagation happens into some other clusters where you can have totally different RBAC set up. Maybe not even giving anybody access to that altogether, or maybe different level of access. 
Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, thank you for your questions, guys.